my name is Ariana Mall, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the bipartisan mission of the Dole Institute. Members of the SAB receive many great opportunities. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. If at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. And now please welcome Associate Director Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Ariana. Good evening, and I would, on behalf of the Dole Institute, would like to welcome you here this, to this evening. Our program is an annual one, Leadership and Globalization in Sports. Tonight's interview will be conducted by the director of the Dole Institute, Bill Lacey. And before we begin our program, there are several individuals we would like to acknowledge this evening. First, a big thank you to Coach Rich Price and members of the Kansas Jayhawk baseball team for joining us. We are also pleased to welcome Dayton Moore's wife, Marianna, Marianne, excuse me, as well as Mike Fox, the co-author of Dayton's book. Tonight, our friends of the Dole Institute join Dayton and Marianne for a special meet and greet and a reception at the Lead Center. If you're interested in joining the Friends program, the contact information is on your program. Immediately following this program, we will hold a book signing because of time constraints. And in order to allow as many of you as possible uh, I would, to get your book signed, I would like you to just pay attention to this. We cannot allow signing of any items other than the books. There is no time for any stage photos with Dayton. And he will sign your books until he has no more books to sign. This is a perfect opportunity if you haven't thought about it to buy books for Christmas, by the way. I have mine already. Tonight's guest is a native Kansan. He was named the Senior Vice President of Baseball Operations and General Manager for the Kansas City Royals in 2006. His tenure in Kansas City has been one of the most successful in franchise history, with the Royals earning 12 Rawlings Golden Glove Awards, 18 All-Star Game selections, a Cy Young Award winner, and the 2015 World Series Championship. You can applause for that. <laughs> and you probably know a little bit more about Dayton Moore from all of the publicity he's gotten over the years. But please, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome General Manager of the Kansas City Royals Baseball Club, our hero at this time, Mr. Dayton Moore. Let's go Royals! Dayton, thank, thank you so you. much for yep. being with us tonight. Glad to join you. Yeah, thanks to uh, all of you for coming out. It's a very exciting night. Uh, not very many semesters when they get to have uh, former president of the United States one week and the GM of the World Series champion the next week, right? <laughs> Dayton, let's start tonight. I'd like you to talk a little bit about your upbringing yeah. and your education and uh, how you got started with the Atlanta Braves. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, well, let me just say this. Uh, I was born in Wichita. My mother actually um, was raised in a small farming community in western Kansas by the name of Coldwater. And, and when my father got out of the service, he took a job with Beechcraft. Right there in Wichita, my mother and father were introduced by mutual friends. And uh, my brother and sister and I were all you know, born there in Wichita. And of course, we grew up rooting for the Royals. And uh, the Royals were a, a very easy team to root for back then because, you know, they were winning. And, uh, and although my father moved us around a little bit uh, as he advanced his career and bettered our lives, um, I always spent two to three weeks every summer in that small uh, town in western Kansas, that small farming community. And, 
And my grandmother and I and my mother's relationship always talked baseball. And we always talked about the Kansas City Royals. So baseball has been a natural love uh, for me since I was a little boy. I, I can never recall a day in my life where I haven't thought about the game or, or dreamt about the game. And uh, I certainly I played as long as I could. And when um, the scouts told me I wasn't good enough anymore, um, I realized I wanted to coach. And uh, coaching was my passion, and uh, I, I got my first opportunity to coach at George Mason University with, with Billy Brown. And um, about five years after that, after coaching and then managing in the summers in the Valley League, uh, the Braves asked me to scout. I originally told them no because, uh, again, my passion was, was coaching. And, uh, but after you know, careful consideration and meeting with the Braves, I decided I was going to do it. And I was going to do it just for four years and get back into college coaching. And uh, then just one thing led to another, and uh, the Braves asked me to, to come down to the front office and be the assistant director of scouting. Uh, so I, uh, after careful consideration, originally told them no, uh, because again, my passion was, I wanted to get back into coaching, and uh, I, I enjoyed being an area scout. And then I got a call from Roy Clark, who worked um, with the Royals, he was a scout, and he called me one night and he said, Dayton, you're absolutely crazy. You got a chance to go down to Atlanta, learn from John Sherholtz, be around Bobby Cox, what are you thinking? So um, we decided to go and uh, one thing led to another and uh, well, we were with the Braves for almost 13 years. How did your time with the Braves organization prepare you to be a successful GM? Well, I had great mentors. Bill, I mean, I had great, great mentors, and uh, I was really, really blessed uh, to be around some super, super people. I mentioned John Sherholtz and, and Bobby. I wasn't interacting with Bobby a lot early, but the last four or five years of my time in Atlanta, Bobby kind of took me under his wing a little bit and was very kind to me and, uh, and helped me a great deal. But, you know, legendary scout Paul Snyder, who actually built the Braves from the ground up in, through scouting and player development, he was the individual overseeing those departments at the time. And... All the great players, those Hall of Famers, uh, you know, Paul started there as a player, worked there as an area scout all the way up, and um, Paul took a liking to me, and I remember I'd get to the office um, about 6, 6.30 every morning, and Paul and I would sit in there, and uh, he'd chew his cigar and drink his, uh, his Coke, and uh, I'd put a chew in once in a while too, babe, sorry, but <laughs> um, we'd sit there and we'd, we'd talk baseball, and, um, you know, Bill LaJoy, Donnie Williams, who actually broke me in as a scout. I was really fortunate to, when we came here to Kansas City to hire Donnie. Donnie remains with us to this day and uh, really a, a great mentor of mine. So uh, I've just had a lot of really, really neat people that have poured into me. Mm -hmm. How did uh, the winning culture that existed in Atlanta influence what you attempted to do in, in Kansas City? Well, as you said, it, it, was, it was a winning culture. It was a great culture. And one of the things that that I noticed early on is we, we had a group of people that cared more about the organization. They put their own needs, their own wants, their own desires as professionals last and the good of the organization first. Our coaches, managers didn't care if they were coaching or managing at the rookie league level or in Richmond AAA. Our scouts didn't care what part of the country they were. It was all about what's best for the Atlanta Braves. And, um, Obviously, John Sherholtz created that culture, and as I said, Bobby was instrumental in, in really motivating people to, to want to work for him because we, we knew that it was going to be a special type of player that would, could perform and play well for Bobby. It had to be a selfless player. So when your leadership at the top is selfless and, uh, and relentless about doing things the right way, it permeates on down through your entire organization, and that's what we tried to do here in um, – in Kansas City and you know like there we, we've got an incredible group of people and in any measure of success that I've ever had in this game is truly a reflection of the great team that we've had around us uh, to allow us to be successful and as I said we we got a similar group here and very similar philosophies and uh, you know just really proud to be a part of it. You had a chance to uh, be part of several other big organizations. Um, how did you wind up with the Kansas City Royals? You know, the Royals were my boyhood team, as I mentioned um, previous, and um, I was never interested in being a GM. So my father always told me, he said, Dayton, he said, work every job like it's the last job you'll ever have. So that was instilled in me from the time, every, every job that, that I was involved in in baseball, and I've been happy in, in every 
position I've ever had. It's a blessing to work in baseball. Um, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I never wanted to be a GM. The first couple opportunities we had, uh, I didn't even go interview. And finally, John, uh, an, inter uh, an opportunity with Boston came along, and John Sherholt said, Dayton, go interview. I said, John, I'm really not interested. And he said, look, Tom Warner and Larry Lacuno are right here in this hotel. Just go meet with them. So I said, okay. So I went and met with them. And really, for the first time, Bill, I began to, um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the conversation. I enjoyed talking baseball. And I remember the big decision that they were asking me about is, what to do with Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz, whether to keep that three, four hole hitter combination together or trade Manny, because Manny was being Manny at one time, those of you that follow the game. And um, I remember there was, there was two things that, that stood out ab about that. Um, I remember the, the importance of how the three and the four hole hitter connected together and how they would make the offense go. So I was absolutely opposed to trade Manny. Now I didn't know how you'd manage him, and I, I didn't necessarily have a, an idea or a quick fix on, on what to do. Remember, the Boston Red Sox had just won the World Series. They'd accomplished the greatest thing that generation had ever seen, winning after 85 years. So when it came down to making a decision to go there, um, you know, I got to thinking, you know what, I'm not sure I want to raise my family there. Our family, we were very young. Um, I don't think we had Robert at the time. I think it was just Ashley and Avery. And uh, so it was more about, you know what, stay where I am with Atlanta and um, wanted to continue to work in scouting and player development. And then when the Royals called, it was a similar, similar thought process, but um, a little more aggressive. It was my boyhood team. The day that we decided to come to Kansas City, I called Marianne earlier that day after a discussion with John Sherholtz, and I called Marianne. I said, sweetheart, we're going to stay right here in Atlanta. Our family's thriving. We've got a great church home. I know all the players. I love who I work with. Um, our time will come a at some point. And it was really a sense of relief. And I think with, with Marianne and, um, and certainly with me. And as the day went on, I felt an uneasiness about that decision. And I felt that maybe I was maybe living in fear a little bit, uh, was afraid to go and maybe experience and try to do something special. And the only re the, 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 the two things I missed most about playing were the camaraderie, the togetherness, the unity of a group, pulling for one another, and the competition. And uh, what a great opportunity to go and compete for a culture, compete for a fan base, to compete for the respect and, uh, uh, of the industry, and to grow a fan base and breathe life back and energy into an organization. And... Uh, couldn't do it alone. It was going to take a lot of, uh, lot of work and uh, hire a lot of great people, uh, which we were fortunate to do. We didn't get them all right away, but um, over the, the first three years, we were fortunate that the right people came available, and they were committed to come here and compete to win in Kansas City. Why did some people advise you against taking the Royals GM job? Well... The economics of the game today are different than they were when Mr. K ran the club in the 70s and the 80s. The economics had changed. And um, it was going to be, in, in, in sports in general, the, the expectation level had changed a lot too. Uh, you don't get three, four, and five years to build a winning organization, especially in professional support, sports. You got to win right away. People expect you to produce, and the Kansas City fan base had been starved for many, many years. They'd been patient for a long time. They'd been told over and over about the great master plan to get the Royals back on track. And when I sought counsel from people throughout the industry, they all said things like, "You can't win in Kansas City. It's a professional graveyard. The owner's not going to spend any money. There's no players in your farm system." And by the way. Your very best player, Zach Grinke, doesn't want to play. So how you, I mean, you can't even trade him if you wanted to. So, um, you know, those were some of the things that, that we were told. And, um, um, you know, again, uh, and after about three weeks of coming here, I believed everything they said and was <laughs> quite certain that we'd absolutely messed up. And I was trying to figure out how to get out from under our house. We had our house on the market probably about two years after we came here. 
because if you remember, in the, we came in 06, June of, uh, June of 06, bought our house in August of 06, and the economy began to tank, so we were upside down in our house, and I didn't know what we were going to do. Your, uh, your book subtitle focuses on building a championship culture rather than a championship team. Why the distinction? Why did you draw that distinction? Well, to, to win in baseball, you, you, especially in pro, at the professional level, you have to have a culture because you've got the Dominican Summer League all the way up to the major leagues. And there has to be an atmosphere of winning, an atmosphere of together. There has to be a commitment to do things the right way from the, from the bottom all the way to the top. And uh, it truly is about a culture. And, and what, what we wanted to do and I use the word we, uh, it's, it's not I, it's not my, it's we and it's us. And when I talk about family decisions, it's just Marianne and myself. We're, we're together with what we do. Our team is together. Our, it, it, it's, it, we're all inclusive and, we're, and all of our success is tied together. But um, the culture has to be the most important part of it because what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do as a group is make sure we create the best place in the history of baseball to work where scouts want to be a part of, where scouts believe in selling the development philosophy and the opportunity to young players around the world, believe in the organization, great place to work, where coaches, managers, instructors feel like it's the, the greatest place in the wor world to teach baseball. And there's nothing like playing. Nothing can ever take away from when the umpire says play ball for you to be out there participating and competing. But the next best thing is working in baseball. And um, so we've, we've tried very hard to make it a great place for, for people to work. Mm -hmm. Describe uh, exactly what a GM does and, and kind of how you approach that role. Well, you ask a lot of questions. Um, <clears throat> you know, if there's 10 things, 10 decisions to make in one day, the truth of the matter is there's, there's probably three, four, seven, seven or eight that, that uh, I've got to seek counsel, I've got to ask questions. A few of them are probably very simple and no-brainers. Of course, you have an instinct on, on what you want to do, but um, you've got to use your people and um, empower them to, to, to make decisions and, and give, your opi give their opinions on, on what you need to do. So I ask a lot of questions. Um, I try to um, make sure that I lead myself well. I feel like the, the general manager, the leaders of the organization have to be the most vulnerable. They have to meet, be the most transparent. Um, they need to be inviting. You want your, uh, your organization to be a place where people's opinions are heard. That's the only way you're ultimately going to win. There's so much gray area in, in, in baseball, Bill. There's very few things that are just you know, black and white and easy. And oftentimes when you make a decision, you don't know if you're right or wrong until three or four years into the future. In fact, over the last couple of years, everybody's congratulating us on our success, and it's very much appreciated, very much appreciated. We're honored that people uh, take the time to thank us. But the truth of the matter is, we were having that success four and five years ago, which led us to this point. I don't know if we're doing a good job right now until 2018, 19, and 20. So, um, you know, there's a lot of gray area in baseball, and the truth of the matter is there's a lot of things that uh, you simply don't have an answer for. Baseball is unpredictable. It, it's hard to figure out. So you ask as many questions as you can. You, you get as much information you can. You're decisive when you make those decisions, and you work hard to make them work. I'd like you, Dave, to take a little bit of time uh, to explain what you considered the most critical steps, changes you made to take what was one of the worst teams, worst franchises in Major League Baseball in taking it to a World Series winner? Well, without a doubt, it was hiring good people. You know, there was three things that we, we felt were very important in the people that we brought on board. Uh, one, they had to be able to apply moral principles in their life. And you say, well, they, well, well why is that important? And uh, you know, if your guy can produce and he has ability and he's got talent, he's going to be successful. Uh, let him go. Who cares what he does off the field or outside the office or, you know, in his own private time? Well, the truth of the matter is I, I've never been around anybody whose personal life doesn't leak into their professional life. And we didn't have time to deal with drama. We didn't have time to, to deal with a lot of things outside the focus of building a baseball team. And uh, so that was important. 
The second thing we wanted in our leaders and our directors was be able to have people that had a, an open mind and a desire to continue to learn. W one thing that's unique about our front office that's different than all front offices in baseball, didn't used to be this way, but it's this way now, all of our people started as area scouts. Very unique to the game. A lot of, lot of people coming into front office today, general managers, they're coming right from the administrative level, they're coming out of you know, Ivy League schools and top universities and uh, they go right into the front office. Our group didn't start that way. And I knew that the game was starting to change from my time uh, in Atlanta. So I knew we had to have people that were open-minded, have a desire to continue to learn, be open to different ideas, diverse opinions. And the third thing that we demanded from, from all of our leaders, they had to be very passionate about the process to win. Because at the end of the day, we knew that we were going to get beat up. There was going to be a lot of dark days. We were going to have losing streaks. We didn't have talent in the farm system. We didn't have impactful players at the major league to trade. So we had to have people that were very passionate and positive about what we were trying to do. And when I would interview somebody, it would go something like this before the interview would start. I'd say, understand this. This is perhaps the greatest challenge in all of sports today. If you're not 100% committed to this organization and to winning the championship, we can't have you. Do us a favor, don't sign on. And we are fortunate to get a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Talk a little bit about the importance of character in baseball, not only for the players, but for the people in the front office and, and, and all the folks who are part of the organization. How important is that? Well, baseball is every single day. It's different than the other sports where, you know, if you, can, if you can jump higher, you can run fast or you're strong, you can probably be successful in, in some of the other sports without really, really committing um, the way you need to do. And there are, there's a, there are players that are, that are extremely gifted and can get by in, in certain, certain areas. But the, the character aspect of it and being able to, to be focused each and every day, again, as I said, if you're, if you're dealing with things off the field, and you're trying to compete against the best of the best, there's no room for error. And so you've got to be completely focused and completely committed if you're going to meet the challenges and win that competition. The hitter against a pitcher, pitcher against a hitter, concentration in the field, defenses, defensive plays are made because you have the ability, you have athleticism, yes, but it's about concentration and it's focus. Well, if your character is in question and you're doing things off the field, that are hurting your focus or robbing you of your focus, you will not reach your ceiling as a baseball player. The players that manage failure the best, the people that manage failure the best are the ones that ultimately reach their ceiling. So to me, it's, it's all about character. And some people would, would disagree and say the clubhouse and the chemistry isn't that important. When I, and I, when I get asked that question, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, a theme throughout baseball the last uh, five to six years, I ask them this, if you talk to any player when their career is done and you ask them what you miss the most, they tell you simply this, within 30 seconds. They miss the camaraderie, they, they miss the togetherness. What they're saying is they miss the environment. Well, you, if you got a bunch of duds and you got a bunch of eye guys and you got a bunch of guys that are jacking it up the, off the field, that hurts the chemistry in the clubhouse. People don't want to be around selfish players. They want to be around people that are about the greater good, and that's the team. And um, you know, I, I, I can give examples of, of teams in the past that had great players that often didn't win, and those great players move on, and all of a sudden, it's like a breath of fresh air is, is, is there, and the team goes on to win. And, and that's a, the great thing about this current group. They care about each other. They care about winning. They care about connecting to the fans. They understand, truthfully, they understand, and we've, and we've told them over and over from day one, your responsibility as a baseball player is to grow this game in a way where some other young player gets a chance to enjoy it. And what I told our team on October 15, 2014, after beating Baltimore and going to the World Series for the first time in 29 years, uh, uh, a feat that a lot of people didn't think would be done. I told our guys, guys, boys, congratulations, but what I'm most proud is you guys did it the right way. And you ensured 
that another group had the same opportunity to do what you did. And once upon a time, the people that came to Kansas City Royals baseball games came because we were playing the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees or the Chicago Cubs in interleague play. And now you have young boys and young girls all over this community, all over the Midwest, wanting to be the next Eric Hosmer, Lorenzo Cain, Mike Moustakas, Salvador Perez, Alex Gordon. And that's why the game thrives, is because players like you respect the game and do things the right way and ensure that somebody else gets an opportunity to do the same. In 2009, Dayton, the Royals lost 97 games, but you got a contract extension. How did that make you feel? What year was that? <laughs> I'm just making that up, no, 2009. 2009, yeah. Losing stinks, by the way. <laughs> it's pretty miserable. Um, you know, the, and I get asked a lot, how did we get through that? Um, well, we had a lot of positive people um, that, that helped me personally um, to get through that. Uh, my faith got me through that a lot, um, focusing on just trying to be as good as you can each and every day and not being attached to what the outcome you want it to be, and that's win a championship, but just try to get better each and every day. But to answer your question specifically, um, you know, I remember it very clearly, um, uh, Mr. Glass um, called me and said that uh, him and Dan wanted to meet with me. Dan is his son, our president, and um, which wasn't, uh, wasn't uncommon. I mean, Mr. Glass likes to meet a lot. He's a great owner. He loves the game. He's a great historian of the game. He's very knowledgeable um, about the game. Uh, he's, a, he's a pusher. He expects results. And, um, but he wanted to meet with me. And uh, we met. And uh, he just said, he said to me, he said, look, we're all in this thing together. And uh, you know, I know there's been some talk about uh, you know, us making a change, and, and uh, it'd been more a national story, I think, than a local story, truthfully. And um, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Again, I've been happy in every job I've ever had in the game. And, uh, but it made me feel good. I mean, uh, I didn't think we deserved it. Um, but it, it motivated us to, um, to, to press forward. I knew the type of man we were working for. And uh, to see Mr. Glass hold that trophy up last year, winning the American League Championship, and then uh, to be able to accept that trophy in New York this year is you know, one of the greatest thrills uh, for me professionally. Mm -hmm. uh, the Glass family got a lot of criticism you know, over the years, before the last few years, but talk a little bit about the role they played in the transformation of, again, a, a team that wasn't very good to the world champion team. Great owners. As I said, Mr. Glass owns a team for all the right reasons, and uh, I'm amazed. Um, you know, how much baseball knowledge that he has. I mean, he has the ability to, to talk about the draft and knows the players in the draft. Um, but they're very, pa very patient. And, and baseball, those of you that know baseball, it, it takes time. It takes time for a player to reach his ceiling. It's, you don't break right into the major leagues. If you're really, really good, you're going to spend three to three and a half years in the minor leagues, especially if you're a high school player. And... Um, you know, we knew that it was probably an eight to ten year process for us to build it the way Mr. Glass was asking us to build it. And um, he knew that he would get pressure along the way to make changes because when, when the fan base demands that the owner makes a change, he really has very little choice because the advertisers aren't going to spend the money, the season ticket base um, erodes, it deteriorates, it goes away. And he might think you're the greatest guy in the world or you got the greatest plan in the world. You know, and he told me one time, and, and um, I know he was talking to me, but he didn't address it to me. And he said to me, he said, Dayton, he said, you know, in my early days in Walmart, you know, we were beginning to grow. And um, we knew we were going to be a very successful company. But the people that got us to that point weren't going to be the people to finish it off. So I want you to evaluate your leadership team. I want you to evaluate our coaching staff and ask yourself, can this group lead us where we need to go? Yes, Dayton, we have good players in our minor league system. You guys have done a great job filling the pipeline. 
but do we have the people to get this group of players over the hump? And, uh, you know, he challenged us at that time. And, um, you know, we're fortunate, uh, you know, to, to win enough games and to, to be where we are. Okay. This is the book, if everybody hadn't seen a copy of it right here. It's, uh, by the way, I would tell you, it's outstanding. And it would be a great Christmas present if you need to buy some Christmas presents tonight. You can get it signed. Uh, but one of the things you describe in some depth is deciding when to bring up Eric Hosmer and a lot of the other young players. Kind of walk us through that process and, and, and how that occurred. Well, never easy. There's three things that I learned early on uh, that have to happen for a player to move up a level. They've got to have ability. They've got to be performing. And then there's got to be opportunity. And if you think about you know, all the shortstops, Baltimore Orioles had during Cal Ripken's days and Derek Jeter in New York. And so there's got to be opportunity. And, um, you know, fortunately, we had a clear pathway in the sense that we didn't have a lot of talent at the major league level. And um, we also knew, and through my scouting days and my development days, it's very difficult for a position player to develop beyond the level of competition. Pitchers may be a little different. You can execute pitches, and you've got arm strength, and you can spin the ball, and You've got a feel for, you know, breaking speed and changing speeds. You can probably, and you can command your fastball, you know, you can advance quickly. Position players have to meet the competition. They've got to experience the best of the best if they're going to make adjustments. And that's why we, we decided, you know, once a player feels, we feel like that they have, you never master the game, but you, you have done everything that you need to do at a certain level, it's important to challenge. Bill of Joy. Great baseball guy, another mentor of mine, was a general manager the last time the Detroit Tigers won the World Series, and Bill was a master of player development. And Bill always talked to me about with players, keep the carrot in front of them. You've got to know when they're about to regress, because if you're not continually challenged, you will have some regression in this game, especially as a position player. So, Again, it goes back to those mentors, it goes back to instincts, it goes back in trusting your people, asking the right questions to, to get the necessary answers. And, uh, but again, you don't know if you're going to be right until players get up there and, and, and begin to compete. And you know they're going to have failures along the way. You look at an Alex Gordon, college player of the year, um, expected to be the next George Brett. Nobody expected him to fail the way he did. But, but baseball's not easy. It's tough. It's a challenge. And, you know, we were asking Alex to break into the major leagues and be the guy. Well, we would transfer players at the major league level in Atlanta where we had a legit three and four hole hitter up there. And we had pitching that could erase all of our mistakes. So you could bring a Furcal or a LaRoche or a Giles or an Andrew Jones or a Chipper up there. And they didn't have to be the star right away. Well, that's what you saw with our club the last couple of years. Paulo Orlando coming up, but everybody talks about our depth. Well, we've got some good depth, but the truth is we've got a good, a good winning environment. And a player comes up there, they feel comfortable, they, don't have to, they know they don't have to carry the team. They just stay within themselves. The biggest mistake players make, there's two mistakes players make when they're young. They feel like that they've got to validate themselves and prove to everybody else that they belong somewhere instead of just figuring out how to help the team win, they want to validate that they, that they belong to, to the coaches, the management, the, the teammates, and so if they execute their pitches, they make their plays, they get their hits, and the team loses. Now, they want to win, but if the team loses, they're like, well, all right, I'm going to be in the lineup the next day. I've earned my opportunity. I'm going to continue to get to play, and until they begin to just play for the team, play fearless, do something to help the team win, be a great teammate, they're always going to be uh, a step behind. They're truly not going to reach their ceiling. And the second thing that they make, when they move up a different level, they think they got to do more. They think they got to be better than they were. No, they've earned that opportunity. Just keep being the player you were, and you will eventually adjust to the game, the speed of the game. Stay positive. Don't start panicking. Don't start vibrating. Just stay positive. Continue with your processes, continue to do the things you've done, and eventually you'll catch up to the level. In, um, in the book, Dayton, you write about this, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about what you feel the role of baseball is in a community like Kansas City. Well, I understood that from my Midwestern roots and, and how special the Royals 
were to a fan base and, and to a community. And, and we all know how special sports are. There's something about it. We love the competition. We, we like the individual stories, yes, but we like to see greatness come together and people achieve things above and beyond. And, and we truly, we live vicariously through, you know, many of our athletes and, and, and our professionals. But um, what it can do to bring families together, unite a city, which what we've been able to, to, to see and, and be a part of is, is truly what makes it special. And, you know, there's people ask me, you know, winning the World Series must be the greatest thing that ever, that ever happened. Well, professionally, it certainly is one of them. But I can honestly tell you, winning is winning no matter whatever. The feeling's the same. And I've been blessed to be a part of winning teams my whole life from a player, a college player, to a college coach, to a college manager, to a scout, to, at all levels. It's, it's a great joy, period. But what, what brings you the most joy is, is just to see how you know, other people enjoy you know, the celebrations. And uh, I know that's a milk and cookie answer. I know it's what you're supposed to say, but it's truly, it's truly how, how we feel with our leadership team. We, we had a special vision, and that was to grow the game in Kansas City. I told Mr. Glass four or five years ago, if we don't begin to win here in Kansas City, I'm not sure there'll be baseball in Kansas City 10 years from now. I'm quite certain that the only way we're going to continue to grow the game and Sporting KC doesn't completely take us over, which I'm not saying I'm not a soccer fan. I admire what Sporting KC has been able to do. Um, but we, baseball needs to grow. And the only way it's going to grow is we win here. And the only reason we're going to get the black athlete playing the game is guys like Lorenzo Cain and Gerard Dyson go out and do well. You know, the best athletes in Cuba, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, they all play baseball. You know, we've lost a lot of our really good athletes playing this game. We still have a lot, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be revived. It's coming back. It's coming back. We're getting more of our, our athletes, and, and we've got the American player has a great heart to play. They're very smart. Um, you know, they're, they're strong. They're gifted. Um, the Asian player is, is much more disciplined than any player in the game today. They love the repetition. They'll do it all day long, and that's what separates them. And we've got work to do in our country with growing the game. But when you win, just like when I was a little boy loving the Royals because the Royals won, I mean, that's, that's the way it works. And that's the truth of, of how you grow a fan, but you've got to win. And uh, the fact that we've won, there's more kids playing baseball in the Kansas City community than ever before. We were fortunate to uh, get one of the, the greatest things that I've ever been a part of coming to Kansas City, the Urban Youth Academy, which is going to be very special. It's going to be an academy that Major League Baseball supports, the Royals, the Players Association, the Kansas City community. It's right in our urban core. It's going to be right next to the Negro Leagues Museum. We're hoping that to have the facility up and running by the fall of um, 2016. And uh, it's going to be a spectacular, uh, spectacular thing for growing ga the game in Kansas City and throughout our community. Baseball obviously has become a global sport. You kind of referenced that uh, just a few minutes ago. I'd like uh, you to take a few minutes to talk about how when you took over the Royals, you adjusted uh, and uh, adjusted to the fact that baseball is now global and started building up scouting and everything in, in other countries. And how important that has been to the world. No, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> from 1996 to 2006, the Royals were dead last in expenditures in Latin America. And Mr. Glass and Dan understood that if we're going to be a model organization, which they expected, they wanted, that was their directive to us, we needed to have one of the very best Latin American programs in the game. And as I said before, a lot of your high ceiling talent at the major league level has come from Latin America. And um, we knew that we had to begin to compete uh, and win the negotiations for those young players. And we needed to make sure that we had a support system in place when we signed them that understood the Latin player, what they experienced. And uh, so it took a, an incredible amount of, of time and effort to be able to do that. Rene Francisco, who's our VP of Major League Operations, International Operations, him and I were together in Atlanta we started together as area scouts together. We're, we're dear friends to this day. 
He is, without a doubt, in my opinion, the very best the game has to offer. He's going to be one of the few ever Dominican general managers one day. Omar Minaya was the first, and Rene will get that opportunity at some point. But, um, you know, we just put an incredible amount of effort and time. And, uh, you know, Salvador Perez, which I know everybody loves, and it's really a great story. And you talk about somebody that uh, is special. You know, Salvi was raised by his mom and his grandmother. And those of us that, you know, under, we all understand the importance of, of male leadership in a young boy's life. And Salvi really never had that. And to see him lead and the charisma that he has and the enthusiasm and the, the genuine passion and love he has for his teammates is truly remarkable and special. And to play the catching position, which I believe there's, there's more um, quality NFL quarterbacks than major league catchers. It's a tough, tough position. And you've got to study, you've got to communicate, you've got to breathe confidence into that pitching staff. And for Salvi to do it at such a young age is, is really remarkable. And, um, you know, it's a, a testament to Rene and Orlando Estevez, who are the two people primarily responsible for, uh, for acquiring him. Now, shortly you're going to be headed to the winter baseball uh, meetings. And I'm curious, what, how would you describe your priorities in terms of uh, what the team needs for next year to be competitive? Well, you never have enough pitching, and um, it's uh, obviously a cliche, but so true. So we'll continue to focus on um, making sure that uh, we, we can compete to, to get as much pitch pitching as possible. We want to keep the back end very strong. You can't win unless you can match up late, and we felt that was important, match up late in the game. We felt that was important because if, if there is such a thing as momentum in baseball, which I believe there is, there's nothing more uh, demoralizing losing a game late, and there's nothing more inspiring and gets you out of bed the next day ready to go than winning late. And so we've put a lot of emphasis on making sure that we have a strong, powerful bullpen at the back end. And uh, Dick Tidrow, who's a, who's a mentor of mine, Dick Tidrow, Bill Fisher, taught me more about pitching than anybody else I've been around. And uh, Dick Tidrow always told me about relief. I asked him all the time about relief pitchers. And those of you may know, Dick Tidrow was a very successful relief pitcher back in the 70s with the Yankees. And Dick always said, I said, Dick, what, what do we need in relief pitchers? What, tell me about it. And I, I always pick his brain every time I'm with him. And he always gets around saying the same thing. Dayton, if you want a successful relief pitcher, they got to have no fear and they got to throw strikes. And, uh, you know, we've always tried to put our bullpen together with, with guys with that type of mentality. Okay. I have one last question. Then we'll open it up to everybody's uh, questions and answers. If you have a question, as I think uh, uh, Barbara noted, uh, do raise your hand. Somebody will bring a mic around for it. We'll go back over that in a second. But my final question, Dayton, is not specifically related to baseball, but we have a lot of members of our student advisory board here tonight. We have lots of folks interested in leadership and public service and business. Uh, if you had to give them a couple of lessons of leadership uh, that they can carry into any profession, uh, what would you advise them tonight? Well, it's, it's probably different for everybody. I mean, my leadership story is, 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 is what it is. And um, I've always felt that your leaders have to be the ones most vulnerable. Um, you, you've got to have the, the right perspective. There's a few things that I, I try to demand of myself. I'm not perfect about it, but I feel it's important for me to make sure that I settle disputes quickly within our leadership team. You know, baseball, there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of uh, arguing back and forth, uh, healthy, hopefully, and oftentimes things will get personal. It's my job to make sure you settle those disputes quickly. I've got to be responsive uh, to our leadership team. I've got to give people more than they expect. I believe in going above and beyond. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to um, stand up for your people, especially uh, in athletics when it's, it's such, a, such a critical nature to it. Stand up for your players, stand up for your teammates, stand up for your ownership, your leadership team. When you win and you're successful, you better share the glory because it's, it's not about you. It's truly a team. You better give credit where credit is due. Uh, I think it's important to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one communication with, uh, with your people. There's certainly times when you have to stand up and articulate a message and direct the path of the group, but you better have those one-on-one -on -one communications. 
And then the, the last thing that I challenge myself on daily is uh, trying to remain calm in the eye of the storm, which is hard for me. I'm intense by nature. My, I'm emotional. Uh, I wear my feelings on my sleeve, and uh, I'm getting better. But, um, uh, you know, I, it's something that uh, I continue to work on. But I, I found that when things get tight and tough, and we've had a lot of losing streaks, uh, you've got to learn to slow things down and, uh, you know, and try to look for solutions and, and, and be calm. Okay, we're going to open it up to your Q&A. If you've got a question, raise your hand. Somebody will bring a mic around. And we have a first question here, a personal friend of mine, Sid. 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 There you go, Sid. Um, Mr. Moore, what is the funniest baseball prank you have ever seen? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of them, but I spoke at an event yesterday at uh, the Johnson County uh, Correction Facility, and I made a com I made a <clears throat> a comment about our people and some of them about them and I said the two things I love most about our group is they love their families and they love baseball and I made a reference about golf and uh, Lonnie Goldberg who's our scouting director gifted gifted evaluator he's got all of our scouts in and um, Lonnie took all of our our guys um, to uh, that top golf place out there that they just built. And I told uh, Lonnie, I said, look, I spoke about all you guys do is love baseball and you, you love your families, you don't golf, you, you don't have golf clubs in your car. And somebody called me on and said, well, really? I saw all your guys at Top Golf the other night. So Lonnie today was fretting about it all day. And you got to know Lonnie Goldberg, his serious nature, and um, we had him going all day. So we're, we're always playing with one another and, um, you know, teasing each other. And it's, it's, uh, that's the great thing about sports and baseball, it's that camaraderie and, and uh, kind of cutting up. So it's all fun. Okay, we have a question back here. Dave, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Glass paid about $90 million for the entire Royals organization. This week, a pitcher signed a contract for $217 million. How do you keep your sanity? <laughs> and worse, and worse can, how's Kansas City going to prosper in this kind of environment? Well, that's a great question, and um, I'll tell you how we're going to win. We're, we're going to keep winning because we're going to get players that absolutely love to play, are passionate about winning, and you, you, those are those are you think th those are really if you can get the players that really have a heart to play, they've got a toughness and and they really want to play, you'll win. I don't know if you'll continue to win championships, um, but you'll win a, your share your fair share of games, but. No, it's 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 crazy with um, with the way the money's being spent, and um, you know, but the money doesn't make the players, and a lot of times the money robs the incentive of the player to continue to to persevere and to work hard. You wonder why Salvador Perez goes out and plays the way he does, and he's banged up and he's got contusions, and how pitchers get through the tough times and their shoulders hurt and their elbows hurt. Not injured, but they're sore. And it's hard playing every day. And the reason they get through it is because they love to play so much that they overcome the, the, the grade one strains and the sprains. And so again, the money doesn't make the player. You gotta keep growing them from the ground up. Your farm system's so important. We've gotta be able to, we're, we're transitioning two to three players, pitchers and position players every single year to the major league level if we're going to keep winning. Great challenge to, to all of our, our scouting development people, especially in today's game, where you don't have the opportunity to step out and sign a Will Myers or a player above the slots. So it's going to be, it's going to be challenging. But from day one, it's been a challenge. We've never made excuses for what we don't have. We've simply just made commitments to what we do have and, and make the best and go out and compete. Okay, right here. Uh, Dave, uh, my question goes back to, I can remember the lean time, the two, early 2000s, when there was nobody in the ballpark. You couldn't even give your tickets away if you had any tickets. When my, when my wife and I got <laughs> used tickets in 2004, and it was so nice this year to go down to the ballpark, and you think 15, 16,000 maybe, and there's over 34,000 mm -hmm. every night. Yeah. That was fantastic. And thank you for bringing the winning back. To thank you. City. Thank you so much. 
Being in, you've just won a World Series. How do you plan on maintaining that success or improving upon it as an organization and a general manager? Well, the same processes that we have went through. I mean, first of all, you got to enjoy the game. Just try to continue to get better each and every day. You can only acquire the players that are available to you. So it's easy to say, well, go get this player, go get that player. Well, most of the time, they're not even available. Um, so continue to take advantage of players that, that are available, that make sense for you. It's important for us to, to um, do the best we can to sign as many as our young players to long-term contracts so we maintain that core. You've got to be right. You got to be right. You got to make sure that um, that they fit your culture and your scouting judgments tell you that they're going to perform over the lifetime of the contract. But um, we'll continue to go through scouting, player development uh, internationally. We got to remain very, very strong. So it's the same processes. Baseball is really not that difficult. You keep it simple. You know, we get so much. The hardest thing right now is there's so much information out there, and we embrace all uh, sources of information, but you can become paralyzed with all that information and you realize that you are, uh, you're, you're truly becoming complacent. You don't realize it because you're trying to analyze all the information and you got to continue to keep it simple. It's pitching, it's scouting, it's player development, it's hiring good people. They're going to go out and compete every single day over 162 games. Okay, we have a question back here. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Dayton. Um, first, congratulations again. Everyone's saying congratulations. But I just want to know, when you took over, baseball was talking about money ball, and that was a big thing back then. And I, you've probably gotten this question before, but you, you prided yourself on defense when defense was all of a sudden, you know, everyone had gone away from defense. They'd gone away from uh, athletes, too. And you've, you brought in athletes again into the game. And I was wanting to know, was that – I mean, obviously, it was a plan of yours, but was that talked about from the very beginning? I mean, even when you were in Atlanta, I mean, it was you had, like you said, you had frontline starters that were just incredible. You don't have frontline starters that are incredible for the Royals. You have very good starters, but you're, you built a bullpen from behind. I mean, was that talked about? Was that was that your plan originally? Defense has always been crucial. I mean, Bobby Cox um, didn't want a player on his team unless they could play above average to plus defense. That was instilled in us. Our ballpark demands that we play defense. You know, we want pitchers that are going to command their fastball, throw strikes, work quick, field their position, hold runners, prepare and compete their tail off. Well, they're not going to want to. They're going to want to pitch away from contact if you're not catching it. They're not going to work quick if they're not in. A, you know, if they're not in a rhythm and they don't trust the defense, they're not going to work quick. Plus, we're a high energy team. When you look at our team, our guys like to go. They want to run the bases. They attack in the strike zone early. They're not guys that would generally go deep in counts. They're getting better. They've done a much better job in RBI situations to go deep in counts. But they want to be active. They, they dive all over the field. So we got to have pitchers that, that work quick and, and utilize our strengths. And, and that's our, our defense and our energy. And, uh, but defense has, has always been important. Again, our ballpark demands it. And there's nothing that changes the momentum of a game, in my opinion, than a great defensive play. And the psychology of the Kansas City Royals is simply this if you're coming to play us. You know if you're one of the other 29 teams, you got to hit the ball really, really hard or it's going to get caught. And we all know as players, there's nothing more frustrating when you square a ball up and somebody catches it, especially if you're, if you're, if you're struggling a little bit. And then the second thing you know, if you're not winning by the sixth inning, it's going to be tough to win. So it, it puts a lot of pressure on the other team to, to win. So we've always tried to do that. Somebody from Sports Illustrated wrote an article, I want to say back in September, saying how the Royals kind of stumbled on this um, with the defense. And Billy Butler's a great hitter, and I'm really proud to be associated with Billy Butler. Billy Butler will be a Royals Hall of Famer. But our first draft in 2007, I told our guys, guys, we will never take a guy like Billy Butler in the first round. We're going to take guys that are going to play. Yes, you're, you're taking them because you think they're going to hit and hit with average and hit with power. But they better be able to play defense. Because if they don't play defense, they're not going to play here. Okay, we have a question right here. 
Um, it, we talk a lot, you know, players have to have athletic ability, but it seems like in the clubhouse, you facilitated this uh, family culture and this winning. Like this year, there was such a belief that they were going to win and they were actually going to come back and win the World Series. But when you're scouting players when they're coming out of college and high school, how can you tell they're going to fit in with the culture you're trying to build? It's the hardest thing to do. Um, you got to rely on your area scout. Again, there is a, um, somewhat of a belief in the game that you know the area scout isn't as important as he once was. To me, the area scout and the minor league manager are the most important part of the organization. Your area scout is the one that is determining the makeup of the player. They know um, who the girlfriends are, what the teachers think of them. They know about the player's habits. Hopefully they've had them in tryouts, camps, and workouts. Hopefully they've seen them fail and see how they respond to fail. The, the failure. The hard thing about that is you don't see a lot of the, the players fail until they get into the minor leagues and they get into professional baseball because, um, and that's when their character is really exposed. But you've got you to evaluate their habits. You know, your, your, you, you, your habits, your, your success is hidden in your daily routine. And if your habits are poor, it's going to come out at the end and it's going to expose you. And you're going, you're going to, um, you know, you're going to be found out. And then your minor league managers, it's up to them every single day to implement those philosophies and help the player manage that failure. It's going to be so crucial for them to succeed long term. But you know, Alex Gordon and I had a conversation um, about uh, four years into to Alex's career and, and some of his struggles. And um, I said, Alex, the only thing you need to worry about, just be a great teammate. Be a great teammate. Just try to do something every single day to help the team win. If you have an 8-10 pitch at bat and you strike out, so what? You're helping the team. Go first to third. Break up a double play. Make a play. Make sure your pregame preparation is really, really good so, so the players can see that. Just be a great teammate. And that's why I think of Christian Colon just popping in my head. Watching Christian Colon prepare every day in pregame, take ground balls at third, short, second, in the batting cage early. He knew he wasn't going to play, but he prepared every single day. And his teammates saw that. And they were all so excited for him when he got the hit and, um, and had the at-bat to, 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 to get the game-winning hit in the World Series. So, um, but, but you don't know, really, until you start living with guys. And some of the players that I've been a part of, you know when you know that you either made a good decision or a bad decision? A lot of times when you're sitting in the home signing the player. When I sat in Adam Wainwright's home, I knew this guy was going to be a big leaguer. The way he treated his mother, the way he res respected the game, the way he talked about his teammates, the way um, the vision he had for his career, I knew this guy was, a, was going to be a man sooner than later. And uh, Ned and I had a conversation in May of 2013 when we were really, really struggling. And a lot of people in the community were giving up on us. They were beginning to write articles about it was time to make a change. And it was the first time that I really started feeling a little uneasy about where we were. I knew we had talent, but you didn't know what was going to happen. I think we ended up winning five games that month. But I remember talking to Ned, and I said, Ned, you know, we were in Houston. I said, Ned, we're beating ourselves up. Yeah, we got talent on the field. But until these players become men, and are accountable to doing the right things, it don't matter what you say to them. It don't matter what I say to them. It don't matter what Rusty Koontz says, who in my opinion is one of the best coaches ever to coach this game of baseball. It don't matter. They gotta become men. So um, that's what we had in Atlanta. We had guys that were men, and they managed the failure. They were good husbands. Uh, they were good fathers. They showed up every day to prepare to compete and, and to win. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. We'll go to the back. Forgive me, I'm going to read this from my notes. But uh, <clears throat> the team's developed a personality over the last couple years, not only for the defense, the speed, and the contact, but also a new way of looking at the lineup in the bullpen. And teams seem to be changing to fit the mold that the Royals have kind of put in place the last couple of years. So did you see or anticipate such a shift around the league to emulate that model that you've built and the culture that you've instilled? And how do you adapt to that shift in the demand for your personnel and your strategy? 
Well, we, we've always just kind of focused on what we do, N never really been concerned about what the other 29 teams do. We, we know what works for us. We understand Ned's style of play. We understand the importance of athleticism and defense in our ballpark. Um, building a bullpen first is kind of a nature of economics uh, as well. Starting pitching is the most expensive um, aspect uh, of free agency. It's the hardest part to acquire. It's very hard for our market to win the negotiations of, of top starting pitchers. We're not even, we don't even have those discussions um, with, 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 with players and agents of, of the David Prices of the world because we know we can't uh, compete to win those negotiations. So um, we've always just kind of done what, what works for us, what works for our market. And um, again, it goes back to our area scouts identifying players that, that really want to play, absolutely love the game, passionate about the game, and we're just going to keep doing it uh, our way. And uh, I don't feel like we've changed the game by, you know, I, I, I don't feel that way. Um, it's, just, it's just how we're set up. When you look at the great teams the Royals had in the 70s and 80s, they were built in a very similar way. The Cardinals' success, <clears throat> they're built in a very similar way. And um, I, going forward, I mean, I think everybody – is beginning to understand, obviously, the importance of, of defense. Okay, do we have a question here? We're going to take a couple more, and that's it. First, I just want to say my date. My name is Dayton too, um, but I was wondering uh, what advice do you have for other like sports management students and who want to get involved in the professional sports world? Hmm. Well, it's it's tough, and it's um, but you got to persevere. There's so many people that uh, I began the game with, either whether it be a college coach or as a scout, uh, they gave up on their dream because they didn't have immediate gratification. They didn't get the necessary, they didn't get the promotion that they thought they deserved or they earned. The truth is, you know, a lot of that stuff's out of your control. And if you have a passion and a love to do something, you continue to, to stay at it. You know, I tell players all the time, um, as long as you think you can play, you keep playing. You just keep grinding it out. And once you lose that spark and that intensity to compete, then you, know, you got to look to perhaps do something else. But so many people have given up on their dream because um, maybe somebody told them that uh, they weren't good enough um, or they didn't have what it takes or they didn't get the promotion and – and, uh, you know, I told Mary Ann when, when we were thinking about getting married, I said, sweetheart, look, I said, look, I'm going to be a college coach. And um, I'm probably going to get fired a couple times. We're going to have to move. Um, I don't know how much money I'm going to make. I don't know how I'm going to be able to support our family. And, uh, you know, for the first three years of my career, uh, I made the most, I made was $4,500 as, as a coach. And uh, then I made 12000 and I actually took a pay cut uh, leaving the coaching profession to become a scout. So you just follow your love and your dreams of, of what you want to do. It's, it's a very simple principle. And, you know, the world's going to tell you that you've got to look out for yourself and you've got to take care, you've got to get yours while you can. But I believe that you do everything you can to help others succeed, be an energy giver, bring value to your committee, to your organization, uh, to your team. And in turn, you will earn the right to lead, the privilege to lead, because your ability to pour in and give to others. Okay. We have one in the back? Okay. We're going to do this one. We're going to do this question, and then you had somebody else scoped out. You can run through, and that will be the final question. Uh, Dayton, thanks for coming to the University of Kansas. Um, I work for the University of Kansas. I've seen some other colleagues in here that work for the university as well. And something that you said earlier really resonated with me. And that is one of the biggest challenges that you have is trying to plan out what you're doing for your player development over the course of the next four or five years and seeing what you're doing now come to fruition down the road. And what we work towards is seeing our students earn a degree, but we often don't really know if what we're doing now is right. going to lead to degree completion for all of our students. And so it's sometimes a, a little bit of a challenge to really assess that what we're doing is, in effect, effective for our students. So I would like to learn if you could share just briefly a little bit about 
what your thought process is or what your decision making process is and staying true to what you're doing now because you believe in the results that you intend to, to get four or five years from now? Well, I'm fortunate to, I mean, this is my 22nd year in professional baseball and five years as a college coach before that. So um, I, I've seen the results uh, of a, a well-constructed plan, the right counsel uh, to a player or a colleague or um, uh, a future leader. And so you have certain principles that you feel that, that will work. And you can give countless examples of, of players and people that followed a certain path and it, it worked for them. But I don't know if there's, you know, there's any, you know, magic formula or it's different for, for everybody. Um, but at the end of the day, again, you rely on just real simple, simple principles. And, um, you know, I had a, a student from um, a, another university uh, interview me. Uh, it was actually three of them. Uh, this past uh, spring. And the first question was, he said, Dayton, he said, look, he said, one of the things I noticed about your resume, he said, you know, you, you didn't go to a prestigious university. You went to a junior college first. I was really surprised that you were a general manager. And I appreciated the question because it gave me the opportunity to tell them that, you know what, this thing's about interacting with people. It's about relationships. It's about, it's about being a servant type leader. It's about bringing energy and value. And uh, it's about, it's a people business. I mean, players are going to play, coaches are going to coach, scouts are going to want to work for people they believe in and trust. And you, you've got to build the human being up and you've got to create those core values because that's what's going to sustain them and ultimately make them successful. You got a, I've been around a lot of gifted thinkers, a lot of very smart, intelligent people. They absolutely are zeros because nobody wants to work with them. They are energy suckers. They drain the life out of everybody because they complain, they make excuses. And again, I go back to Alex Gordon. Alex Gordon is perhaps the, one of the greatest leaders as a player. I've been, is he vocal? No. Does he stand up in front of the cameras and articulate well? Not necessarily. But what Alex does is he embraced every situation that he ever dealt with like it was the greatest thing to ever happen to him. He never complained. He never made excuses. He never lashed out at the media. The fans were beginning to boo him. Reporters asked him about it. Didn't make excuses. Didn't blame the fans. Just realized what his place was and went on to make the best of whatever situation he was in and became an all-star, a four-time gold glove winner, a platinum winner. He's got two championship rings, including a World Series ring, because of his ability to lead himself well. Okay, two quick questions. Um, this gentleman would like to know more about Major League Baseball expansion outside the United States. Good question. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's gonna happen. I, you may see a true World Series someday. You know, obviously we have, um, we, we have, um, the World Baseball Classic, which I'm a big supporter of. I love the international game. I just love baseball players. I, I, I just, I love, I love what they're about. And um, so I, you could see that at some point in time. Um, obviously we have a team in Canada. Montreal wants a team. Mexico City, I know, wants a team. And, um, you know, a lot of it's gonna come down to, you know, what the union wants to do, what the players reps want want to happen. Travel is a big part of uh, the game going forward, uh, the amount of games. You know, some players feel like that we need to play 154 or 58 game schedule instead of 162. Some of them feel like spring training's a little too long. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, but you may see a true World Series someday. Okay, final question right here. Hello, Mr. Moore. First off, thank you for all that you have done for the Royals franchise and our city. Uh, and my question is, a couple years ago, you decided to trade Will Myers for James Shields and Wade Davis. And a lot of people were questioning that at the time, and obviously it paid off uh, very well. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about your thought process be behind such a monumental trade. We got another hour? <laughs> <laughs> 
No, we want you to sign some books. Well, so you know what? I'm just the, the thing I'm really relieved of. This is this is the first place I've been in four years where no one's asked me about Bubba Starling. So this is the last <laughs> question. <right? laughs> no, that's a great question, and um, you know, um, it, it was that was very challenging for us. But I knew what our plan was from day one, and we had our first organizational meeting in 2007. January of 07, and we needed Billy Butler and Alex Gordon to, to turn into productive major league players, hopefully sign them long term. They were in double A at the time. We needed to advance our international program very quickly. We needed to um, raise a group through scouting and player development, the draft, get them to the major leagues, blend in with Alex and Billy's talent. Hopefully it's not too late. They're gone to another organization. And blend their talents together and then do everything we can to help them win a world championship. If Will Myers would have already been in the major leagues, it might have been Mike Moustakis if he would have been in AAA. It might have been Eric Hosmer or Salvador Perez if they would have been in AA or AAA. Because again, the plan was to make sure that these guys, uh, we did everything we could to support them. And if you recall our team during that period of time, we had a lot of young guys that broke into the major leagues. Everybody in baseball said the Royals perhaps had the best farm system in many, many years. And we had a lot of young talent at the major league level. But we had a very unsuccessful season in 2012. Our players perhaps regressed somewhat. Again, they were trying to catch up to the league two to four years playing every single day at the major league level to become a consistent producer. Okay, so, but our players were starting to doubt a little bit and we needed them to, we needed them to be rescued a little bit. Um, and for them to become the great talents that we needed them to be, Perez, Moustakas, Hosmer, Escobar, Kane, even Gordon and Butler to a degree, we better get some pitching to kind of tilt the field in our favor. So by the third or fourth inning, they don't feel like they're out of the game. And, and um, so we needed to get pitching. And we had Will Myers, the matchup was good. Uh, Tampa Bay had a, a, a depth of, of starters. James Shields was somebody we were going to deal. We actually tried to get David Price instead of uh, James Shields. Didn't happen. They weren't going to trade him. And... Um, you know, we were able to, to win the negotiations to, to get that deal done. But if you're, if you're focused on what you're giving up, you'll be paralyzed to make a deal. And Will was a tough pill to swallow. He was tough to give up. Minor League Player of the Year. And, um, but we knew what James Shields and Wade Davis could potentially bring to us. Never, I didn't know we were going to win. I felt we would play competitive baseball. Didn't know we'd be in the playoffs, didn't know we'd win our division, didn't know if we'd ever have a chance to win a World Series. But I knew if we didn't do that deal, we wouldn't have a chance. If we did that deal, something good could possibly happen. If we'd rel relax our players, take the pressure off them offensively, let them mature at their own natural rate, only if you have pitching that keeps you in the game from the first pitch to the last pitch. James Shields, Wade Davis certainly did that. Dayton, thanks for a fantastic Thank program. We really Thank appreciate you. it. <laughs> Dayton is going to be signing books for us, so uh, if you'll queue up with your book at the back, back there, my staff will help Bill, organize let me say, that. Let me say something about that, if you don't mind. Um, I'm not a very good author. I, I very rarely read books, let alone write them. So <coughs> I apologize up front. But Matt Folks, who's a co-author, really is the, uh, the nuts and bolts behind it. But you know, my wife and I, we started a foundation about two years ago called the See in the Major Leagues Foundation. And you know, the Kansas City community had been so faithful to us. And we, we just knew we needed to be faithful back. And um, so we started a, a foundation. And several people associated with our foundation encouraged us to write this book. We did it for three reasons. One, we wanted to write our own narrative about our journey here in Kansas City instead of the local media or the national media telling our fans why we were successful or why we weren't successful. Secondly, we could bring honor to a lot of terrific people 
within our organization who have done so much heavy lifting and so much sacrifice to help us win. And thirdly, all the proceeds from the book go to support our foundation. So that's the inspiration uh, behind uh, the book, More Than a Season. So it's not only a great read, but you can get it signed tonight, and it's a great gift, and it's also for a good cause. Dayton, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.